Welcome to the Metal Voice and a return to an iconic guitarist and fellow Canadian and Montrealer, uh, Frank Marino. Frank, it's so, I'm so happy that you know you're you're poking your head out and you're being productive and doing something great. Frank, welcome I'm to the show. Trying. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, Frank, before we get into anything, how, how's the health? How, how are you doing these days? I'm hanging in, man. I'm hanging in. Just waiting for things to get. All right. We are, we are kind of worried about you. You know, I think a lot of people are worried about you, especially in the music community. There's a lot of love for music. There's a lot of love for you. And uh, we're, you know, we're all praying for you and hoping for you that you got better. And you know what? I'm really excited to see that you have been productive. And these pedals are very exciting, Frank. How how do you hear about them? <laughs> well, how I heard about them, I, I I was on YouTube the other day. Oh, okay. And so you heard the interview. I did hear the interview, and I go, "Frank's back." That's the first thing I thought. <laughs> and it was kind of like a relief that you know you're 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 productive, and you know a lot of people were were scared, you know, and they they were scared for you and. Well, I was ne- the only thing I had stopped was touring. Yeah. Really. I mean, it's hard to play sometimes, that's true. But uh, I hadn't stopped that. I, I, I think it was sort of like you, you, you made a statement. And then when people make statements, they, you know, they, 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 their imagination goes wild, right? And yeah. And, you know, guys, and I guess people think the worst, right? And, yeah. but I'm, but I'm sure a lot of people, and I'm, me and Alan, for sure, you know, we're saying, you know, it's, it's, it's great to see that you're back, at least in some way or form, right? Well, I mean, yeah, I, back is a, is a weird word. It's like, <laughs> I, I wasn't really I mean, I was gone from touring, touring, and I'm still gone from touring. I mean, at this point, um, but I still, I'm still thinking of music, and I'm still playing. You know, like I'm still who I am. It's just that the illness uh, makes it really hard for me to, uh, particularly to tour and to do, you know, go do gigs now. If it subsides, and, and it has been subsiding slowly, um, then maybe we can think about doing something, you know. But in the meantime, I wanted to stay somehow connected. And I figured the best way was I thought about my pedals, and I thought about how uh, so over, over the years so many people had asked me, how do you get that sound? Uh, and I would always tell them, well, I build my own stuff, and I design my own stuff. And I started thinking, well, maybe I should take these designs and, and rebrand them, rebuild them, and let people let people have a chance to uh, to use them. I remember our conversation that we had before COVID when we did an interview with you, and you were telling us about pedals, how... You make pedals. You've always made pedals. Yeah. yeah. And not only and computers ampli- and, and everything. And amplifiers. I put out an amplifier, too. I put out my amp, too, if, if the laws weren't so stringent about it. There's like very stringent laws about putting out an amplifier. you got to pass all kinds of electrical, you know, you know, buy these electrical licenses and stuff like that because you're using high voltage and stuff, you know. So I don't have the ability to do that at the moment. But I figured pedals, the pedals really were the, you know, the sound in, in the 70s that I had was pedals because in the 70s, I didn't use a Marshall. I used a transistor amplifier, which is a very clean amplifier, an acoustic 270. And I just used it to amplify what was my pedal board. <laughs> my pedal board was basically making all my sound. So when people heard, you know, the live album or Johnny Be Good or whatever, they weren't hearing an amplifier. They were hearing my pedal board. 
Mm-hmm. And then later on, I decided to design amplifiers that sounded like my pedal board. And so now I can use a smaller pedal board with the, the three or four or five main pedals that I use. And I figured I'd take three of those, which are, are uh, distortion pedals. And um, there are three types of distortion. Okay. Uh, and uh, I would put them out and see if people would like to use them. And uh, the first one, well, not the first one, but one of them is basically a, a clean boost that drives the front end of your amplifier. Um, it doesn't have its own distortion within it, but it, what it does to an amplifier is very interesting because it makes an amp sound really good. Um, the next well, one has its But, but, but own Frank, distortion. let me ask you this. What would, what yeah. would be an example of the first one if there was a song in your catalog that would be a good example of the first one? Well, I I would use the first one driving the front of the amplifier if I was doing the blues, like the harder blues stuff. You know, like uh, uh, King B. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right? But not the, not necessarily the solos. You know, like the, the rhythms, the, the tough rhythms of, of like Johnny B. Good or King Me. Um, the other pedals are the pedals I would use for the solos. Turn them on for the solos. One of them has a full equalization, bass and treble, um, and nice gain, really beautiful gain. And it would be what you would call from a light aggressiveness to a mid to hard aggressiveness. That would be the thing I would use if I was soloing in, let's say, He's Calling or um, or uh, Something's Coming Our Way or something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the third one is a medium and heavy aggressive game pedal. Like it's, and it's got two uh, modes, a softer mode and a harder mode. And you would hear that when I'm doing electric reflections of war, when I'm doing bombs and I'm doing all of the really wild really fe- feedback and all of that kind of stuff. So those are the sort of three facets of what I do, the blues, the leads, rock and roll leads and the psychedelic you know over the top stuff oh someone's calling no, <laughs> heard the doorbell door right. for somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Who's, whose doorbell is <laughs> what do you think of the idea i think it's an excellent idea alan I mean, you've been known for your sound. Uh, I mean, reading all the comments on the internet, that people just keep talking about your guitar playing, your guitar sound. So, anytime you can share that, get it out the genie out of the bottle, and then share it. I think it's a good thing for for, for everybody. So, I think it's a great way to preserve your legacy as well. You know, uh, I I think it's a brilliant idea. I think it's in your wheelhouse. This is what you do, at least from what you told us many many times. Mm-hmm. And how are you manufacturing these? Well, I'm doing it all myself. <laughs> so it's basically, amazing. these are handcrafted. Beautiful. It's not manufactured like in a, I didn't team up with a company or anything like that. I have one helper, a kid named Ryan, who helps me. And um, basically... I'm putting together everything myself. I'm going to sign them in tier, like I'll sign the inside of the pedal. They're very boutique. They're all handcrafted. Uh, the designs are all my own. I did the schematics. I did the board layout. I had the boards printed because I wanted, I wanted boards. I didn't want all point to point wiring. It would have been a mess. So I have the boards printed. Um, and, Basically, I make the case, and I have it painted beautifully. It really looks good. Like, these look really, really, really professional. They look great. Um, And they sound exactly right. You know, we we did some... 
we did some a being, you know, where we could actually press a button and have me going through the new pedal, the pedals I'm making and the pedals that are on my pedal board right now, <laughs> the ones that I built 40 years ago. And you couldn't tell the difference. Oh. There was no, it wasn't like, oh, well, this one's a bit fizzier or this one's not as strong or this one has a weird mid peak or something like that, which you'd expect with two different pedals. Like if you, if you tried to AB like that with two, two different pedals, um, you'd notice instantly that they didn't sound the same. For instance, if you took a blues driver and a big muff or something like that, you know, but these when AB'd with their original counterparts were really, really identical to the point where I didn't know which one was on. <laughs> so they're 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 right up there. Are they so going to be okay? Go ahead, Alan. Sorry. What what's the go to market strategy, Frank? Is it a uh, custom Web made pay. per order, or how are you going to pre- get yeah these yeah up made per order for sure for sure because how many can I make in a day? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm 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 literally sitting there doing this. You know, this is handcrafted, and so it's not like somebody could say, oh, I want 10. <laughs> well, that's going to take me a few days to make those 10, you know, um, and put them together and make sure they work and, you know, all that stuff. And we got really nice packaging for them and um, instructions, and they're very, very, it's very pro, like it's a very pro kind of setup. It's not, doesn't look homemade or anything like that, but, well, uh, but yeah. it is. Well, if there's one thing that you're known for, it's a tone and, you know, you giving this tone or, you know, lending your tone to someone else, I think it's a wonderful idea. And, and, and you know what? It's probably, did it keep you busy during COVID? Well, <laughs> The problem with with COVID was I was going through my own problems, you know, like I, mean, I, I wasn't at all worried about COVID. As a matter of fact, I'm not even a, I'm not even vaccinated. So, you know, it, 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 in some ways it turned out for the best, because let's say I just said I was going to tour. They wouldn't have let me into the States. Yeah. So yeah. my getting sick was almost, you know serendipitous like it was almost lucky (laughs) that i had to stop touring because i wasn't well and then all of a sudden covid happened and i wouldn't have gotten into the states because of covid even if i was well because i wasn't going to take their vaccine yeah and i still haven't and i won't in a way how do people order these how do they get these or, or, or well when there, you... I, there'll be a pay, it's not the page is not out yet <laughs> okay. the thing that i'm waiting for is i'm waiting for um i have to trademark uh the names mm. so i can't actually put them on the web until i've gotten my not i won't get the trademark but i get i've got my application you know yeah. And once I get that, as soon as I get that, then we'll make a beautiful web page and some YouTube videos of me demonstrating the pedals. And, uh, you know, there'll be a, people will know at that point how to get them, but it'll be direct. It'll be direct to me. You know, people will be buying them uh, directly from me. And like I said, I have one partner who's helping me. And um, I, I did have to... Uh, to get some people that I know to put up some money to be able to do this. So, so there are other people involved in terms of, of, uh, you know, the fact that they're going to make some, some, some money off of it. I, uh, I, I, I'd like to sell them really, really inexpensively, but my partners, (laughs) my (laughs) partners are saying that that's not something I should do. (laughs) Handcrafted by Frank Marino. No, yeah. I, I think you should go the other way. I, I agree. <laughs> That's exactly what everyone's saying, and I don't, I don't really understand it, and I don't know what the numbers should be. And I'm, I've been asking a bunch of people about it, and you know, I'm, I'm deferring to those people who do that kind of thing. You know, uh, they'll, I guess they'll tell me, but 
They're, yeah, they're handcrafted by me. They are my designs. Um, they are my sound. Um, and the, then they're signed. <laughs> now, you know, when someone suggested that I sign them, I didn't know what they meant. Like, do I sign them on the outside? That'll make them look bad. <laughs> it should be a signature on the pedal. Like, that would be like... So they said, no, no, you sign them on the inside. Like, on the inside of the, the cover or something like that. Okay. So is that is that how that's done? You tell me, guys. Uh, you, know, you know more than I. I, I this we, is not something we, I do. Well, I'm a guitarist. You, you, know? you don't get asked very often for our signatures, Frank. So we, you're asking the wrong two guys. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, how how about this? I think there'll be guitar players who will be interested in the pedal because it's a pedal and it's by you, and then there'll be collectors who just want to mm. buy the pedal because it's handcrafted and it's signed by you. That's my mm -hmm. opinion. And if the price right. point is right, and I'm not saying it's got to be cheap. I'm just saying if it's a right price point where it's affordable, then people yeah. will, yeah, that, that's my opinion. I think I would even buy one because, you know, I, even though I play guitar rarely, but I buy one just as a collection thing, you know, maybe I'll buy three. That's well, what, one interesting thing I noticed just the other day was I took the, the small one there, the clear boost, the clean boost. And, um, I tried it on a bass, and I was astounded at how good it made the bass sound. Mm. Like it really, it really had a full, full range deep, deep frequency response. So I'm wondering if bass players would be very interested in this pedal too. It's not, it's not the fuzzy distorted pedal. It's the, the, the clean boost one, you know? And, um, and I was wondering, I was thinking, wow, this really, this bass all of a sudden sounds like really, really, really good, you know, with this thing. So maybe bass players would be interested in the, uh, in the first one as well. Sure. You've what already would, got a marketing strategy. Why limit you know yourself what? to guitar players? <laughs> I, I'm happy we had this brainstorming meeting here today. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like guys, you know, I'm 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 the musician, guitarist that's sort of been my life. And now to be building pedals, I've only ever built them for me. Yeah. And many guys have come up to me over the years and asked me what I thought of their pedals. So for instance, I did, um, I did a favor for, uh, Pigtronics because, you know, I had, I had spoken to them about one of their pedals and they made some changes based on what I had said. And, um, so I helped out by demonstrating some of their stuff, you know, um, and I did that for a couple of other things. But then there have been other guys that have come to me and said, listen, we want to make a pedal with a signature, I guess they call it a signature pedal, with your name on it or your signature on it. And here's the pedal we make, and we'll put your signature on it. And I said, no, because the pedal they made just didn't sound good to me. You know, it's not the one I made. So... I never really considered putting my signature on pedals or guitars or amplifiers if I didn't actually approve the way they sounded, you know, even, even though they offered me, you know, good money to do it. I, and apparently this is what they do with a lot of guys. They just offer them really good money and they put their name on it and the guys get a royalty or something. But, um, I'm really very, very interested with the sound being ac accurate. Yeah, and you and should. If I say to somebody, listen, I'm playing He's Calling, and if you use this, you're going to sound like He's Calling. I want it to be true. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, what seems to work well with pedals is limited edition. You know, uh, you know, 500, and that's well, it. Well, they are pretty limited. <laughs> that's, 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 to, 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 to production. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be... I, I, I can't see me doing this a lot. How much, I don't know. But right off the bat, it's going to be limited to those who who order it and, 
you know what? I don't know when that stops. It's not like I can say there's going to be 20 or 30 or 50 or 100. I can't. I don't know. The price it's just went up, Frank. The price just went up. Yeah, I know, but it's going to really depend on, like, once it starts. Let's say, perfect. just run a perfect example. I started, I put out the page, I get an order, and somebody wants all three pedals, all right? Mm-hmm. Now, I've got to build those three pedals. So I've got to get the parts, build the pedals, test the pedals, make the pedals, you know, do all that stuff. At that point, I've delivered it to that particular person. Now, how long did that take me? Did it take me a week? Did it take me two weeks? You know what I mean? Did it take me a couple of days? I don't know yet. I'll know when I do it. And that's what's going to ultimately be the factor which says these are limited or not limited. Because I'm not trying to start a pedal company where I have an open-ended... You, hey, you can always buy these from now until forever. I'm sure at some point I, I won't want to be doing this all the time. You know, maybe I'll want to be playing gigs. <laughs> so in that sense, they'll be limited, but I don't know what the number is supposed to be. Well, I mean, does it take you more than two days to, um, to put it together? Let's say somebody no. wanted three pedals. No, no. Well... <sighs> It's 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 hard to say. One pedal, they're they're not simple inside. They're not. They're, there's quite a few connections to make. It's not just a couple of transistors or something. You know, mm-hmm. like there's a lot of a lot of connections to make. Uh, there's you know over thirty resistors, twenty capacitors. Uh, for switches, all kinds of JST connectors. You know, there's there's all these, the, the jacks, the light. So this is not something I'm going to build in an hour. No. But, but uh, you know, it might take a day. It might take, might take I, might, I might be good at it enough that I could do two in a day or three in a day, you know. Like, but then again, Ryan is helping me. So without Ryan, I'd really be screwed. You know, he's sort of really, really, really helping me. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got to put the price of how long it took you to, you know, make them, and that's just basically what the cost is going to be, and that's that, right? Yeah, like right now at the moment, I'm not even thinking about about uh, price or anything like that because it's all been cost. Basically, I had to borrow a lot of money to get the parts, get the cases, get the paint done, you know, get get all that stuff done, the machine work. Um, I'm right now. It's more a cost thing than a than a profit thing. But at some point, we're going to decide. Okay, here's what the price is going to be, and hopefully, people will buy them and will pay off the the costs. You know, uh, I, I'm I'm the I'm the um, in the whole team. I'm the esoteric guy. Like I'm the spiritual guy. You know, like I'm the one. That's talking about the sound and the tone and uh, the the blooming, whether it blooms under your fingers or not. You know, uh, pedals have to make it easier for you to play. You can't have you don't have to you don't want to have to fight with them. Yeah, they almost like turn you into a better player if they're well made. And, and you found the secret formula because I. I can't get my head around the fact that you're building a brand new pedal that sounds like your original pedal from from 40 years ago. That's amazing. Well, they are they are direct copies of what I built. So they are going to sound the same, you know, like there's a few different parts because some uh transistors aren't made anymore, so I have to use substitutions, you know. But I went through a lot of different substitutions to get the closest thing possible so that it wouldn't wouldn't be noticeable. Um, and so that's why we did the A-B tests, you know. Um, had I had every single part exactly the same as 40 years ago, I wouldn't have even had to do A-B tests because I would have known what they were. But doing the A-B test tells me that, yeah, these, 
you know, these really sound like they're supposed to sound and they really do what they're supposed to do. And quite honestly, I could go out and gig with these pedals now and not have to have my pedal board. Yeah. Um, wh- like when do you guy fall- called me over to his house or for a jam session, I just put these three pedals under my arm and go. Yeah. Now, granted, when I play, I also use other pedals like echo, delay, reverb, sometimes chorus. Those, I'd, those I would have to bring also. Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking of building uh, a fourth pedal, uh, which is the special compressor that I had built for myself a long, long time ago, because I figured some guitar players would like to have this compression. So we'll see. I don't know about that yet. I want to see how this goes first, and if it goes really well, then maybe I'll go to a comp- you know go to a compressor or even a flanger or some phaser or something. When so, you, uh, so Frank. Go. I'll throw out some some of your song titles, some songs too, and you recommend which pedal you use for those songs. How's that? So people get a feel of, of what each each pedal represents. How that work for you? Well, yeah, I can know, but I can I can do it the other way around. Like like I can tell you that because the pedals right now have names. I'm just not allowed to say the names until I have the trademark. Right. Okay. So we'll call them one, two, and three, all right? But okay. they have names, and they have, and the names that I use are the names of my songs. Oh, okay. So I can tell you that, for instance, I have a song called Ain't Dead Yet that a lot of people like. They listen to it a lot. Uh, it's from the power of rock and roll. That would be pedal number two. From the solos. Then I have, I have a song called, uh, most of them would be pedal number two. Uh, well, let's put it this way. Do you know the difference between doing, quote, the end of night guitar solo and the guitar solo within a song? So that's pedal two and three. Okay. Like the end of night guitar solo is pedal three. It's the one where you really turn on the overdrive and you go crazy and it's amazing sustain and you can make it sound like a bagpipe or hort mm-hmm. wild horses or whatever. And But most of the night you're not using that kind of wild, wild overdrive. You're using a kind of an overdrive that's sort of mid-range-ish, you know, halfway there. And that's the kind of pedal that would be number two. So for any songs like that, and the number one pedal, the clear pedal, that would be, for instance, if I'm doing my version of Red House or I'm doing the, we have an unreleased blues that we just put out um, the, that was uh, done the night of the DVD, but was not released with the DVD. It's called mm-hmm. Unreleased Blues on YouTube. I don't know if you've seen it yet. No, nope, not yet. But we'll check it out. Yeah. But that would be pedal one. I'm still trying to look get up, through the look up look up unreleased blues DVD from Frank's DVD on YouTube, and you'll you'll hear it. It's a, it's basically a, a similar to my version of Red House on the DVD, but much shorter. Hey Frank, I think once mm-hmm. you said you told us that, and and I find this fascinating. And correct me if I'm wrong. Every solo that you ever played, or maybe not all your solos, but many of your solos, you came up with them in the studio. Like there was no planning. Is oh, yeah. All of, them. all of them. There was no like map of what you're going to do but pre- never. prior. Never, never, never. Not even once. Wow. Well, was that because you wrote the songs in the studio and you just kind of like were like sort of riffing off of each other in a sense and you're inspired or well it's 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 very much like when i play live like i don't really play the same exact thing every night but it's a similar thing because the song has already been created so you want to have somewhat the same right but when you're first inventing um basically you just listen and it's like saying it's like singing along with it. If, if you sang along the solo every night, would you sing along the same solo? Yeah, well, it'd be very a little bit. Yeah, I got it. 
You would, but it'd so, be little variances. So let's say let's say there was a, a new song that you guys went into the studio and you recorded and you played the rhythm track. And it's going, you know, ba da na 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 da na 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 It's doing that. And then you're supposed to solo over it, right? Mm-hmm. But you don't solo with your guitar, you solo with your mouth, with the kazoo, let's say, right? Mm-hmm. You'd make stuff up as you go, right? Yeah. And it would probably fit. That's what I do. That's pretty amazing. Just in, invent it as I go. As a matter never, of fact, yeah. all of the songs are written that night. You mean like, like right never, when you go in the studio? Yeah, yeah. We, we <laughs> didn't ever go into... Only there's been uh, three songs, three, I believe, in my whole career that were being played before I went into the studio. Wow. And that was really early on, like way early in the Maxoon days. And so were you, were you able to get, st- was there a lot of hemming and hawing? What do we do guys in the studio? Or you guys went in and you just, you were able to just to blast them out? No, I would just go in and say, here guys, here's the tune. <laughs> I just invented on the floor. Wow. And, and they'd play along with it. And then sometimes I'd say, okay, no, 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 play this instead or play that. You know, everybody's been through that, right? Uh, and so they play what I say or roughly what I say, but in their own interpretation. And, uh, and that would be the song. So like a song like Stories of a Hero, it, there's no mapping. That's just strictly feel right in, on the spot. Boom. That's, that's the song. Yeah. yeah. And as a matter of fact, it's an interesting song because... That one had a a change in the middle that went, you know, from D minor to D major all of a sudden. And that was totally spontaneous. You know, when yeah. it says, and the stories tell of bravery, it's a, it's a different kind of feel at that point. But you also must understand that under none of the circumstances of any of the songs did I um, write the lyrics first. I wrote the lyrics after. Everything was always done as an instrumental. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. How, lo- how long did it take you to write the lyrics? Did you write them? Or was it was it uh, like it took like me the a songs? lot longer than it took me to write the song? <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> Sometimes it would take me all day because I wanted to write lyrics that fit the music and that okay. said something that was interesting to say at the same time and i wasn't really good at it i thought you were great what about your singing i don't know you if know, you were early calling... on i thought early on i thought i couldn't sing at all so i talked my way through a lot of the, the songs and then later on i started to notice that if i tried singing i actually could hit the pitches so i got better as a singer as I got older and um, because I got more confident in just singing in my own voice. And so by the time I get to the, the last show I did, the DVD, I'm probably singing better than ever before. <laughs> Alan? No, I mean, uh, just uh, I'm glad we were able to speak to you and, and, and delve a little bit further into this uh, somewhat uh, new career path. And uh, anxious to see when uh, when you've got the trademark and then the publicity when you're ready to launch it. So, well, who knows how long it'll last? It might only last a week. <laughs> I mean, we're, <laughs> yeah, we're only going to find out like when I do it, right? Do you foresee like I guess it'll take probably take like a year at least? I would think. Right. Take what? A week. Oh, a year, a year. Sorry, sorry. A year to a year to get it done. No, no. This is going to be. These are going to be out probably within the next two to three weeks. Oh, there you go. Oh, so you're finalizing the trademark then? Okay, you're at that. Oh stage. yeah, 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 yeah. I thought you just submitted it. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. We're, it won't be the way it works. Is as long as you've submitted, that's your sort of your okay yeah, to start. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's pending. Yeah. We um, could conceivably, we could conceivably have these things ready to go 
Well, we could conceivably have them ready to go in like a, the next week. We've got the boxes made and the covers and all that kind of stuff. So, you know. I, I'm, I'm scared to name some songs because it might be go one ahead, of the titles. Because it might be one of the titles. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I, I might blow it all for you. I don't want to do that. Yeah, we'll yeah, we'll yeah, say yeah. had enough because had enough pedal. I don't think that's a good right. Idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, had enough would be pedal too. There you go. <laughs> well, I would have liked Ditch Queen as a pedal, but I'm not saying nothing more than that. That would like, also be pedal too. Okay, all right. Because I mean, that tone on that guitar, you know, that's you know that that's that's the greatest tone right there, you know. Well, just remember that the pedal is part of the tone. You do have to have an amplifier. Yes, You're not going to yes, plug the yes. pedal directly into your computer or something like that, you know, like, or into a mixer. You've got to have an amplifier that you're driving the pedal with. So the tone is the tone you get is part of the part of the package, but uh, the amplifier won't matter as much as you think it will. Like as long as it's a decent amplifier, you know, it's gonna it's gonna get you where you're trying to go. Hmm. I learned you know, something new today. You know, on another note, like me and Alan, we talk to a guitarist, artist, musicians all the time, and it always comes back to you, no matter who we're talking to. Like we could talk to Chris Holmes from Wasp. We could talk to I don't know Lips from Anvil. We can talk about oh uh, Jack uh, Zach Wild and. And even Tesla, uh, Frank Hannon, uh, so mm -hmm. many guys cite you as their influence, and they're all from different. Even Gus G, like you know, he used to listen from Greece. There's so many mm -hmm. guys from all around the world who cite you as as a huge influence on their sound, uh, or one of their influences. We could also say, right? I mean, yeah. how does that sit with you? Like, do you think about that, well, or I'm, do you think I'm, I'm flattered by it? But it has it has more to do with time than anything else, because I, when I came out, uh, you know, I was a young person in the industry, and everyone else was older than me. When I made my first album, I was sixteen. I was touring by the time I was seventeen, and you know, by the time I was nineteen, I had done three albums. <laughs> So, you know, Strange Universe, Child of Novelty, Max Zoom. Um, <clears throat> my fourth album, I was only 20 years old. So I was, and I started doing all that touring in the big buildings. So a lot of the guys that saw me then, I was doing the shred kind of, I was probably one of the original guitar players. If you think back to that time, the late 60s, early 70s, there weren't too many guys doing the shred thing, you know, like playing at high speeds and, very violently. Um, and so I was one of the original guys that did that because my, my, um, my uh, confreres at the time didn't do that. You know, the Eric Clapton's and the other guys like that, they, they were more s slow players, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that's what caused the influences you're talking about was the fact that I went out there a little further. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Um, Alan, do you have anything else? No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I'm in sales, Frank, and all I hear is uh, cash registers going off with your with your project. I mean, I wouldn't. <laughs> I know you're. I know you've always looked out for the fans, and like you said, you're more of an artist, and and, and you're leaving the business side to other partners. But uh, I think this is just a winning combination for you. So, and your and your partner. So, well, I hope it works. Yeah, you know, I hope it works. I hope that. Um... I hope people like it, <laughs> you know, like that's really my, my biggest hope. I hope they like it, whoever buys it. Well, I think first of all, they'll be excited that you're back on the radar. I think that's number one. And then now you have this other project. They'll be very excited and hopefully, hopefully, you know, you can tour, you know, uh, in, in if the my health future. gets better and the government stops its stupidity of saying you can't come in, you know, without being poked, then, you know, who knows where it goes, right? Right. Yeah. Well, I think they're supposed to uh, remove all restrictions <laughs> by May. I don't know if that's going to be, it's going to happen or not, but that's what they're saying. Well, they just, uh, they just stopped that tennis player, Djokovic, 
for the U.S. Open. He wasn't allowed in, and he's like a 22-time Grand Slam champion. Wow. And they stopped him, but I don't know when the U.S. Open is, if it's before May. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, it is. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anything else you want to promote, uh, Frank? No, no. I just, uh, I'm just uh, glad to know that you guys are interested. And uh, yeah, like I said, if you check out the uh, unreleased blues song, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you'll hear pretty much what the uh, one, what the number one pedal does. Sure. Great. All right. On that note, oh, uh, there was one more question I want to ask you. Oh, that's what it was. You know, you read on the internet. Yeah, these these bizarre sort of things like you were the incarnation of Jimi Hendrix and mm. yeah sure Jimi Hendrix was you know you know what someone who you appreciated his work but what do you say to that? I say that the people that invented that don't know history because hold on sure. I'm just swallowing something. Okay. <laughs> While it was true that I went to a hospital and it was true that I learned how to play guitar in the hospital and it was true that it all happened very, very quickly and it was true that the style I played was highly reminiscent of Jimi Hendrix. Psychedelic, basically. Mm -hmm. What wasn't true was what the newspapers made up in the media, talking about spirits and reincarnations. And the very reason that could never have been true was because I went to that hospital in July of 1968. Actually, August of 1968. Mm -hmm. Jimi Hendrix didn't die until September of 70. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... (laughs) There was no way to come out of the hospital within a few months and have some kind of reincarnation of a guy who wasn't dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's been clarified. It's been clarified. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I've always found it ridiculous, to tell you the truth, because the guy who wrote that, the first guy that wrote that, that got picked up on the wire and everyone started talking about it, made a huge thing out of it, they should be so ashamed of themselves. <laughs> he made it sound like you said that, right? He made it sound like well, you they, said they made it sound like it, and that's why I started doing songs that were very tongue in cheek. I started basically razzing them. <laughs> you know, I did a song called "Making My Wave," where I'm very tongue in cheek, saying, "Oh yeah, yeah, I've come back from my grave. Oh yeah, wow," you know. <laughs> It's like, uh, I remember when I did All Along the Watchtower, I did that specifically because I knew that I'd get a hail of people in the press screaming at me over Hendrix again. And I could then say, well, it was a Bob Dylan tune. Yeah. You know. I was always a little pugnacious like that. Like, uh, (laughs) if people said things, I, I would push back a little, you know. But um, all in good fun, you know. Sure. But the guys that write the stories like that, the reincarnation, and then it turned into a car accident, and I died, and was resuscitated, and saw the <laughs> spirit, and, you know, one thing led to another. How could they not put together the years? The years, 68. Yeah. Even the ones that said that that happened to me knew that I was in the hospital in 68. Hmm. It was in their article. Would would you call Hendrix more of a spiritual godfather? Well, Hendrix was just... Hendrix, to me, was the... um, the watershed. Like He was like the generational talent that comes along and changes everything and influences everybody in from a guitar perspective and not only from a guitar perspective but from a psychedelic sound perspective richie havens once told me who was he was a good friend of hendrix 
And he once told me, Hendrix didn't play the guitar. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he played the amplifier. <laughs> and it made perfect sense to me when Richie said that. Because that's true. Hendrix yeah. played sound. You know, people that do their Hendrix impression immediately go off at lightning speed and hit the highest notes they can, right? Yeah. But if you listen to any Hendrix record, I don't think he ever played anything faster than an eighth or a sixteenth note. It's true. Yeah. It was always very slow. But he had that sound and he had that ability to put the right note in at the right time. It's and amazing. Leave notes out at the right time, you know? You know, it's amazing, Frank, how in parallel yeah. you're in Canada and you have Uli John Roth in Germany. And you're sort of yeah. like these two, like you're sort of like a mirror of each other in a different continent, you know, it's, and you're both coming up. It's just incredible. Did you influence him? Did he influence you or you just didn't even know about each other back then? No, I, I, I uh, did a tour with Uli in the early 2000s. But I'm saying but before in the 70s. Be, I never knew about him before that. No. Okay. Yeah. I know he was into Hendrix. Yeah. But I never, I never knew about him before that. You have to understand that I tried to stay away from the Hendrix thing at some point because it was just killing, killing me. You know, like right. the press was killing me. The press yeah. hated me. And now, the only if I ever read that stuff again, I know the guy must be at least seventy-five or eighty years old. <laughs> the guy that's saying it, he's got to be from that time. Yeah. Because lately, I don't get that from, from new writers. Have you been writing any new music? I'm always writing music. <laughs> well, I, how about I, this? To release... They're not always the same kind of music. Not always the same kind. I've written over 80 pop tunes. Oh. Pop tunes. Real pop. Like the Beatles. Mm-hmm but they're not going to show up on Mahogany Rush albums. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's for sure. Any chance of uh, any rele releasing them in near future? You know, I wouldn't release them as me doing them. I'd probably give them to bands that would do them justice because they're, they're, you know, they're pop. I don't, I don't really do pop. I mean, I do, but I don't do it publicly. Mm -hmm. But I've written jazz tunes, and I, I fooled around with the starting a blues album that I never finished. It's been half finished for 10 years, <laughs> and it's a totally different kind of blues album. It's not, a, it's not a Texas guitar blues album at all. It's more like a New Orleans blues album with piano and B3 and horn. Hey, it worked for Rick Emmett, Frank. I mean, uh, you know, he did all these different albums, uh, jazz album, blues albums. It could work for you. Yeah. It's just that I don't do these things in order to put them out because how do you put these things out anymore? Nobody, who, who's buying albums? No, that's, buying a, albums. No. that's a whole other discussion, yeah. <laughs> yeah, an album now is like your calling card. It's like your credit card, uh, like your business card. You know, you give out your album and hope they come and see you live or buy your merchandise. Mm. But to try to say that you're going to make money off albums, who, who can do that? Yeah, nobody. Nobody. Yeah. I mean, unless you're Taylor Swift, you're not making any money off that. That's for yeah. sure. You know what? On that note, On that I think the pedal is the way to go. That's the new album. Ish. <laughs> yeah. That's a new idea for an album, right? You sell your merch and it's something that people can use and something people can get inspired by. And it's, yeah. or it could be a nice cool souvenir, right? Um, and if I do another record, I might go with vinyl. Yes. They've outsold CDs, apparently. Yeah. In the last quarter. So why not? And just make vinyl. Don't make any other digital copies of it. And who knows, right? Yeah, the easy the easy thing about vinyl making vinyl records, you know what it is? They're mm. really short. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what that's what made albums so great. 
was the length yeah. because you yeah. know once you start adding you know 17 tracks on an album you know you start you know it, it just loses the dynamic i There's think gotta 10, be some filler 10 to 8 songs is a perfect album the yeah. greatest albums were 10 to 8 songs yeah. those were the but greatest really albums easy to make when they're short you know absolutely and you give it all you got too on every song yeah Frank, on that note, but I, I think they're I think they're charging way too much for vinyl now, though. Absolutely, like forty five yeah. bucks, fifty bucks. It's insane. But I mean, people yeah. are buying it. People are buying it. Look, you know, you could have the pedals on one floor, and you can have vinyl on the other floor, and uh, you know, you probably make more money doing it that way than going on a record company. Yeah. Well, look, I'm never going to get rich off of pedals. That's for sure. Hmm. I mean, um, the margin is, you know, they're not cheap to build. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I'm sure there's a lot of work to it, too. You know, uh, you send they, out They ten- could be cheap to build. No, you can build them really cheap. You can build them under $100, you know, like if you, yeah. if you use cheap parts and you don't care how they sound. And look. But uh, if, you, if you're thinking the way I'm thinking, where they've got to sound great, they've got to have good parts that last, they've got to have a good sound, they've got to look good, they've got to weather the storm well, that's not something you're going to build uh, with cheap parts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we wish you much success with this, uh, Frank, and uh, we're anxious to see the packaging. And, and like you said, it could be as, as little as a couple of weeks from now. So we're definitely going to keep tuned and uh, and anxious to see it. Yeah, stay in touch. You'll be hearing about it. Great. Send me send me the link to your web page when it's up, and we'll post, and uh, you know we'll share links and all that cool stuff, and we'll have you back on again to uh, talk more about the pedals and if there's changes or any updates. You're always welcome. That'll be great, man. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank.